Hello, and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, episode 25, Blue Plate Special. Coming to you from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We're here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. Each week, we hope to highlight some of that feedback, both positive or negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. If you'd like to let us know uh, something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. So on my birthday a couple days ago, I sent out a tweet noting that an awesome gift for me would be for people to like, share, follow, and subscribe to our content. And along with that, I put out a bunch of links to all the different places you can find the Tabletop Bellhop. And one of the things I specifically asked for was an iTunes review. And now it didn't happen on that day, but I went over to iTunes just to look at our reviews. And there were our nice, shiny five-star reviews we told you about before. And then I looked down and got something I wasn't quite expecting. Chip Chuck gave us a one-star review and wrote, the episodes would be half the time if one co-host didn't rephrase, rephrase and repeat everything the bellhop says. It's maddening. Well, we did say we appreciate comments, both positive and negative. While obviously I don't feel like I'm doing that, we're happy to see what our listeners say. So please, if you find it a problem, let us know and we can work that in, uh, on that in the format. Now, Chris Groff wrote about TSR Marvel Superheroes. I have plenty of fond memories playing this game, but we tried to start it up a couple of years back and just couldn't get back into it. Marvel Cortex has spoiled us for hero RPGs. Well, thanks, Chris. I am also a big fan of Marvel heroic role-playing. That's from uh, Margaret Weas Productions, and sadly out of print, uh, Marvel pulled the license because the cinematic universe kind of blew up there. It got a little more popular than everyone expected it to be. Uh, I've got to say that Marvel Heroic Roleplaying to this day is the best superhero game I've played. It is also one of the best roleplaying games I've ever played. I love the Cortex system. What I dig about this was the paradigm shift of realizing in that game you are not playing a character. Instead, you are the guest writer for your favorite hero. And it does it so well. Plus, it's the only game I've played yet that is a Marvel superhero game where Spider-Man can beat the Hulk by making him cry, and that works mechanically. It is fantastic. Now, Anthony Cypher Unlimited, at Spriggs18 on Twitter, had a quick comment about Marvel. Nice. That system brings back so many memories. Thanks, Anthony. Good memories, I assume. The last comment about the Marvel review from Phil Hatfield... We had lots of fun with TSR's Marvel superheroes. It is still the superhero game that I hold up to all others for comparison. If it can't capture the feeling of MSH or do it better, it doesn't get played. Excellent. Thanks for the comment, Phil. So one last comment from Chris Groff again. Uh, this is about Keyforge, based on our Gaming in the New Year content that we put out. This one's a little long one, so bear with me. I bought a few boosters and finally managed to find a store with a starter set for a retail price. So I've got that headed my way. I think I'll have a pretty good grasp of the rules now, but haven't really played an actual game yet. I have been playing against a solo AI that someone created, which seems to work well. I believe this is one, though, that I think my wife will enjoy. It's certainly more mechanically complicated than Star or Hero Realms, but not as tricky as, say, Epic, which it totally bombed with her, as did other CCGs in general. A trade-off, though, is that there appears to be a more rewarding play element to the game using your deck, which I hope she'll enjoy. We both enjoy the Realms games, but you are very much at the mercy of the trade row and its timings. Here you can get a deck and learn all of its synergies. Well, thanks, Chris. I may have to check out that AI myself. The link's in the chat room, and it'll be in our show notes. Uh, now, Mo and I spent an hour or so on Etsy last week to get me some tokens, mm -hmm. so those are coming in. Starter sets are still crazy hard to come by, and mm -hmm. it turns out so are the actual decks. Um, yes. But if all goes well, we'll be able to uh, stream some of our plays now and then uh, once I can uh, finally get my hands on a deck. 
So to end things on a more positive note, since we started on a negative one, in the middle of our Gloomhaven stream, we had a new viewer join us. Uh, that was Naobi Shoiru, or Shiru. I apologize if I'm pronouncing that wrong, who commented in the middle of the show. We'll have to catch the rest of the podcast. Time to put the kids to bed. Just found the podcast this week and binged them all. We're going to try to catch the live stream when I can. Thanks, guys. They're also kind enough to give us a follow on Twitch, and we love new Twitch followers. Turns my room purple. It's pretty cool. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the Bellhops Tabletop? So every week, I like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of this week in review at tabletopbellhop.com. So it was a, a re really good week. It was a good week. Um, started off playing some Race from the Galaxy online, uh, did the Gloomhaven live stream, did a bonus live stream of Gizmos, hit up the uh, local game store for more Gizmos, then tried Terraforming Mars with Prelude, and then a two-player game of Dinosaur Island. Excuse me. Then on Sunday, my daughter taught me a game. Harry Potter's Hogwarts Battle. And from what I hear, Sean even got some games in last week. Yeah, I got in uh, a round of Hogwarts as well, and my son and I finally cracked open the Duke and got it on the oh, table, nice. along with our usual BGA games. Yeah, so last week in our Gaming in the New Year episode, uh, we both talked about how Sean and I finally sat down together and we managed to teach him how to play one of my all-time favorite games, Race for the Galaxy. No Alleluia music this week, though. Uh, one of the things that Sean noted was that uh, he was looking forward to playing on Board Game Arena now that he's learned the game. And man, have we been playing a lot of Race for the Galaxy on Board Game Arena. Like, I think we've knocked off at least six games, if not more. Uh, since we aren't doing the uh, drafting, we can knock out a game pretty easily between doing other things. Uh, much like learning it, though, I find that playing it distracted <laughs> uh, on a couple of days when work's been hard for, uh, for me is just as bad as when I was trying to learn it uh, distracted. So it, it does take a little bit of focus and a little bit of concentration. Yeah, it definitely, it, it plays better if you play real time. You sit down and just take your turns in order and play for a full game. It is very easy to come back and look at your hand and look at your tableau and go, what was I doing with these two things? So Friday night was Gloomhaven night. I'm very happy to report that I seem to have figured out all my issues with OBS and the stream went well. Well, fairly well, because we were dropping some frames and stuttering a bit, but that's not something I have any control over, at least until MNSI, my internet service provider, gets fiber internet in my neighborhood. I've already upgraded to the best I can get here, uh, just for you guys out there, so you guys and gals. So there's nothing more I can do. I'm going to blame Twitch, I guess, for how choppy our stream was. Well, despite the occasional stop-motion look, the sound was bang on, and while more quiet in the chat, another fun session for viewers. Yeah, I am looking to do something new this week, so tune in Friday. We'll see if I if I've managed to pull off uh, something with two cameras that hopefully can show off the game a little bit more. So as for the game itself, the stream went great, but our Gloomhaven game, not so great. Uh, it's not that we didn't have fun. The game was fun and enjoyable, and all four of us had a good time, but we failed our mission fairly harshly. Um, i got to admit, I take some of the blame for that, as we probably should have gone back to town. Uh, trying to think of putting this in role-playing terms. You have your D&D &D party, you're at level two, you have a character ready to level up, and you have enough money to go shopping. Instead of going back to town, you go down to level three. That's kind of what we did. But I also noted last week, I talked quite a bit about what I'm really digging about Gloomhaven now is the RPG aspects that are starting to come out of it. Now that we played a bunch of games together, we're starting to have characters, right? They're, they're more than just board game pieces with names on a sheet. And while when I play my Savage Craigheart, I play him as fairly impulsive. And when I saw a shiny stone go through a portal to the elemental plane, I couldn't help myself. I had to jump through, which was definitely not the most strategic choice for the entire group. Now, added to that, we definitely were not playing our best. Uh, there were times we got in each other's ways. There were times where I thought in the planning phase, we had down what was going to happen. And then once we played out the actual phase, Stuff got misconstrued or misunderstood or missed, and we had some wasted turns, and just we, we were not on our best game. Um, 
the mission itself seemed very doable, right? Not like when I was talking a few weeks back about the windswept highlands late last year, actually, and how difficult that mission was. This was not, didn't seem like an overly difficult mission. Uh, it just seemed like we weren't prepared and played not the best. So after losing, we bit the bullet, headed back to town, back to Gloomhaven. Uh, that gives chance for Kat to level up her character. Because one of the things we did the math, uh, she died, sorry, became exhausted again. If she had had one more hit point, she would have lived, or at least lived another round, possibly long enough for her to heal her. Well, if she had gotten that level, she would have had that hit point. So, uh, you know, we went back to town. Um, I managed to level up because we get lots of mission. So that's something cool about Gloomhaven, if people may not know if they haven't played it. When you fail a mission, you keep any golden treasure you found and any XP you earned, but nothing else. So you don't get any check marks or things like that. So even though we failed, our characters improved, right? We got stuff out of it. While we're back in town, though, a couple cool things happened. Uh, we managed to unlock one of the envelopes, one of the legacy aspects of the game, a sealed envelope that comes in the game. I think it's a B. Um that we got for buying blessings at the temple. This is the buying blessings is right in the rule book. I'm not spoiling anything there and I'm not going to tell you what's in the envelope. So don't worry about spoilers. Uh, we managed to spend enough money on blessings because that was the other thing we're thinking is going back. We're going to go in blessed, which makes us a little more badass. Um, we got to open that. The other thing is we got Gloomhaven's prosperity to level two, which is a big step in the game. So a couple things happen when that happens is now if any of us switch characters or one of us retires and comes back into the game, we start at level two. So that's a nice setup for going forward. Anyone who starts playing my copy of Gloomhaven is going to start at level two. The other thing is you add a whole bunch of new items to the shop because it's supposed to represent Gloomhaven's becoming more prosperous. There's more people in the city, there's more crafters, and there's more stuff available. So that's really cool. I actually really like the fact the town evolves as the game goes on and that the Gloomhaven in our game now is different than the Gloomhaven that was there at the beginning of the game. Level up. Gloomhaven gains new equipment. For some reason I'm having a Sega Master System flashbacks. <laughs> it's a rise from your graves. The what is it, Altered Beast, I'm reminded of. So I don't want to spoil the envelope, but I will just say one thing. Because the last time we opened an envelope, I did say people may want to hold off. In this case, don't bother. Like, if you feel like opening it, open it. Right? Don't hold off or don't rush, whatever. That I, there, I don't feel bad about opening this one at all, whereas I still feel kind of guilty for opening the other one. We should have held off on that one. So it was still pretty early when we finished Gloomhaven. Not necessarily because we lost, though probably because we died before the end of the game. Uh, but we had some time left. It was still relatively early. No one had anything to do in the morning. So we decided. I decided to break out Gizmos because Tori hadn't played it, Kat hadn't played it, and Angie Games still hadn't played it either. I played it on New Year's Eve, um, but none of the others did. They were all playing other games. Uh, I think Angie Games was playing Terraforming Mars, and Tori and Kat weren't at the New Year's party. Uh, and then we had all the tech set up, right? Because we just streamed Gloomhaven. So I figured, why not stream Gizmos too? Well, this one was a bit tougher to watch as the, the cards that really make up a yeah. lot of the game don't really read on camera. But you do get a nice feel for the flow of the game. And there are that, and there is the big marble uh, shoot and things to sort of keep the uh, viewer's interest. Now, again, I, I'm, we're going to try something different Friday, and maybe that'll improve the overall experience to be able to see the cards better. Heck, maybe we'll play Gizmos after we finish Gloomhaven this Friday. We'll see. Uh, I am hoping to do some tech upgrades for our next cast. I have no idea. It may not work. It may look just... It didn't look horrible, but it it's, was not optimum. You really couldn't tell what cards we had. So I talked enough about Gil uh, Gizmos last week. I told you how to play, basically. I'm not going to get into that here. Uh, if you really want to see it, just listen to our last episode or go over to the blog and read about it in the On the Table section. I am still digging it. That's what I will say. It's still... It's now my my go-to quick under-an-hour engine builder, my my filler engine builder. Uh, the other players dug it. Uh, I think NG Games seemed to really like it. Um, she's worried she's too good at it now and we won't be able to beat her. I hope to disprove her next time we play. Uh, Tori did note, though, that he preferred the tactile feel and simplicity of Splendor. So I get it. I know there's people who go both ways on this game. For me, though, Gizmos over Splendor any day. I might even put my copy of Splendor in the Extra Life auction at this point. Luckily, there are more than enough games for everyone to get a favorite these days, and no one's left out. <laughs> yeah, we said it many times. Uh, the, there's pretty much a game out there for everyone, and not every game is for everyone. 
So on Saturday, NG Games and I headed down to the CG Realm for their first game night of the year. Uh, they've improved their game nights a bit. They're now running twice a month, so on the second and fourth Saturday of the month. And they're also now doing premieres. Um, they actually got Cool Mini or Not to give them a game called Victorian Masterminds a week before it's actually released. So if you went down to the game store on Saturday, you got to check out this game that wasn't even available on the market yet. And they also had a deal, if you dug it, you could pre-order it for a discount. So good on CG Realm for trying to improve their game nights and make the store about more than just Magic and, well, now Keyforge and other card games. Heads, uh, a thumbs up for that. So we started off the night with more Gizmos. Uh, four players again. Anchi Games, myself, and two new players, which were Charles and Ross. You've heard me mention Charles before on the show. I'm not sure if I mentioned Ross. Uh, it went well. Uh, both players seemed to really enjoy it, and I actually really enjoy it. And I'm near certain the store would have sold at least one copy, if not two, had they been able to have it in stock. Just goes to show you we're driving ten, uh, trends, at least in one town. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if we're driving trends, but I, I do tend to sell games sell people on games because well i show off games i really enjoy and if i really enjoy them i assume other people will probably enjoy them so after gizmos i set up terraforming mars now this was my chance to check out prelude i got prelude for christmas this is the third yeah third expansion for terraforming mars uh i w I'm, was really hyped to do this now before we started playing i took out absolutely everything from venus next because I really wanted to judge Prelude on its own. I didn't want to know how Prelude played with Venus Next. I want, and, and we used the base map, so I didn't use the Hellas and Elysium expansion either. I just wanted to see Prelude with the base game. So we took the time to sort the cards while having some Coney Dogs from the Windsor Sandwich Shop. And then I did a really quick teach of the new rules. Uh, we were playing three-player at that point. Uh, it was uh, Charles, and she Games, and myself. Um, for those unfamiliar with Prelude, I know most people who play Terraforming Mars already have it and love it. Uh, there are three things. It adds three things to the game. So really simple, five new corpse. Mix them in with the rest of the corpse, shuffle them up at the beginning. There is a variant rule that we used where if you really want to see the Prelude corpse, give because you normally get two corpse and pick one, you take a Prelude corp and a non-Prelude corp and then pick between them. We did do that because we wanted to see the new corpse. Uh, there's eight new project cards, which... To be honest, with how thick the project card deck is, I don't know how much eight matters. But I think every single one of them had an Earth tag. And from what I've seen, it's to better balance the tag distribution in the game. Plus, the things that are on it fit the Prelude concept, like it fits the theme as much as those cards ever are themed. So that stuff's pretty basic, right? Just toss it. And I don't see any reason I'd ever filter those out of my game. They're It's new corps, new projects. Great. The bulk or the meat of Prelude is 35 new Prelude cards. Now these are um, landscape cards with pink backgrounds that look like corporation cards, and there's a good reason for that. So at the start of the game, everyone gets four of these, and they're gonna pick two of them to use once the game starts. So again, it's just like picking a starting corp. Now one weird rule that I thought was neat is you don't have to pick them until you can see what everyone else's corporation is and what all their starting resources are. So that's kind of interesting. You can kind of see which way everyone's going before you decide which Prelude cards to do. And then what the Prelude cards do is kickstart the game. Now, I'm not talking Kickstarter. I'm talking Jumpstart. Like, get the game going quicker because each card has one or more tags. So you start with tags. And they also give you resources and or production. So instead of starting with zero resources and zero production, maybe with a tiny boost from your corporation, you actually start with significant production in something or a couple things, depending on which ones you take. Now, what this does is it speeds up the game and it gives you direction at the very beginning because starting a game of Terraforming Mars, your corporation may give you a bit of a direction. Like if it's a mining corporation, you're probably gonna try to get more steel, but then some of the other corporations are just like you start with lots of money and you're kind of like, I don't know what to do. Well, this gives you some direction. It's like, hey, you're gonna take these two preload cards. They're both gonna give you plants. You're obviously gonna focus on plants all game. And it was interesting. Uh, just the other morning, I was uh, browsing some uh, <clears throat> Reddit. And uh, someone brought up uh, Terraforming Mars, and almost every single comment universally said, first expansion, get Prelude, it's a must-have. Interesting, interesting. See, what I was worried, and still kind of am, is that Prelude would make it too short. 
like, I don't know, like, all these people have been complaining Terraforming Mars is too long. I personally think I like it where it is now. Like, it feels like the perfect length. It's like an hour and a half to two and a half hours, depending on how many people you play with. And to me, that's a sweet spot. I don't want a filler one-hour game of Terraforming Mars. Like, that'd just be too short. So I was worried that adding Prelude in would make it feel less fulfilling. Now, I've only played once. So based on the one play, I don't, I didn't feel that at all. Like, yeah, maybe the game was a bit shorter, but not like an hour shorter or anything like that. Um, I, I liked it. I liked the jump start. I liked having direction. I liked the drive. I love the fact that now the game's more asymmetric, even more so than before. Every player is going to start off very different from every other player right from the start. And I dig that. So I like so far, I like it. So far, my worries about making the game too short are unfounded, but I played once. So really, I got to give it a few more tries before I fully determine. But we did play three players, and it definitely wasn't short. Again, we were probably in that hour and a half time frame, which is still perfect for me. Now, after Terraforming Mars, it was getting late. Uh, we were at the local game store, and they do close, right? Unlike my house, where I can just play till three in the morning. And we only had about an hour left in the game night. And I had brought my Kickstarter copy of Dinosaur Island, the, the shiny extreme edition. And I kept hearing on podcasts and reviews that it's very short. So I grabbed the box. I took a look. It said one to two hours. Now, I know that in the game, there are um, scoring cards. And the way the game ends is you use them up. And you pick between if you want to play a short game, a medium game, or a long game. So I knew there was a short game version. So that should bring it to that hour point. Plus, I also, had, having read the rules, knew that there were specific goals to pick for the first time you play that are supposed to make it even shorter. So I'm like, all right, it's going to be an hour. It's going to be less than an hour. We should be good as long as we use these teaching rules. So we decided to give it a shot. Now, at this point, it was just Angie Games and I. Uh, Charles and Ross left. There was a group still playing Victorian Masterminds. There was a group playing um, Star Wars game. Oh, it was... Um, the new Warhammer game, Warhammer 40k Blackstone Fortress, which actually looks really cool. It's Warhammer Quest, but in the 40k universe. Looked awesome, but that was way up the back of the store. A bunch of miniature games playing that. So as far as board gamers, it's just the two of us. So I figure this is good too, right? Um, why not? Why not set it up and we'll learn it. So then when we play next time, I'll know how to play and I could teach it better. Now, what I didn't account for was setup time. This game is a beast. Like, okay, dinosaurs, beast, haha. Um... But it's it's bad. Like, there are just piles of counters. There's, like, not even counters. Like, I guess counters. Cardboard buildings and cardboard things. They could have been cards, but they're, they're cardboard. They're thick. And they're, like, stacks, big stacks of these things. There's lab improvements. Um, the different, three different types of dinosaurs are each of stacks. And then this huge stack of uh, attractions, right? All the things in your theme park. And you have to go through each of these and remove all the two or the three and four player only tiles, right? So they all have a little picture of a head on them. And if you're only playing two players, you got to pull them out. So we had to sort through these piles and then we had to set out the player boards. So each player has two significantly sized player boards. Like think of the Terraforming Mars one times two at least. And then there's three player boards that go between the players and then besides that, there's the coins, there's the dinosaurs, there's a baggie with your visitors to the park, there's the, the slap bracelet, which is awesome, the one-player token. Like, there's just a lot of stuff in this game. And not only that, it took up a ton of room. Yeah, you aren't kidding. For those who are following you on Twitter, we got to see that set up uh, that night, and I could not believe that that was for oh, two it's... people. I was there when you unboxed it, so in theory, I knew how much it was, but but seeing it, you know, just come out of the boxes and you didn't punch anything that night, and then mm. to see it all spread out on the table like that, that was crazy. I mean, that was a serious hog. Not quite as much as, uh, um, oh, there's that one game that everyone complains they don't have a table big enough to play. Uh, the colonists that's one i don't know there's others yeah. but uh but yeah it was that that was definitely a shocking uh, no. photo to see like it's big i'll be fine at home i have an eight by four table at home at the game store it was a little tight they're i think they're three by six tables they're much they're much shorter you're much closer together which is good in some cases but it, yeah it managed to work so like it it the other thing is man i've never had this before with a game but i wanted a box insert i wanted one badly because of how much pain it was to set up. So did we fit it in, right? Well, by the time I set it up and we were taking our first turn, I think we had 25 minutes before close. I figure there's no chance. But then I learned something else about Dinosaur Island. Man, that can be a quick game. 
The first game, using those suggested scoring cards and the suggested plot twist card, took three turns. That's it. Three. You go, I go, you go, I go, you go, I go, done. Well, it's nice to know that it has option, but that is a lot of effort to put in for not oh, yeah. a lot of payoff in terms of game enjoyment. You don't get to settle into a groove at all. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, but, uh, like, it definitely... It was not very fulfilling, I will say, at that player count. But it served its purpose, because the whole point of Anshi Games and I playing this were to learn how to play, so that the next time we sit down with more players, we can better explain the game and we get it. And I got to admit, it helped. Like, the rule book isn't the best. It's not terrible. But reading it, it sounded way more complicated than the game actually is. Having played those three turns, I'm like, oh, okay, now I get it, right? There was a lot of... of uh, uh, light bulb moments, I guess, playing versus, oh, okay, I get why that happened. Oh, I, and really, it's not a hard game. But at this point, all I've got under my belt is one rushed two-player game. I'm going to leave any more thoughts about it for future weeks when I get to play a full game with more people. So, big setup, no insert, uh, the component quality. What, how, was, uh, how was that, at least? It's, it's decent. Uh, it's really impressive. Uh, the wasteful, like the dinosaurs are all really cute, but there is absolutely no reason whatsoever they need to look like different dinosaurs. And I guess in the first version of the game, they just all look like Stegosaurus. So if you have a dinosaur in your park, it's a dinosaur. And while when you get a new dinosaur to build, you can make like, say, a T-Rex. And I guess you could put a T-Rex token because it's cooler. But like we found it fiddly to try to find the right dino. And eventually we we're just like, yeah, just give me a dino. That's all that matters. So it looks neat. Uh, the metal coins are amazing. Some of the best metal coins. I think we talked about that during the unboxing. Like these are up there with those iron clays for, for money replacement quality. These are amazing metal coins. The start player slap bracelet. I got to admit, I'm a child of the 80s. I thought it was pretty awesome. I should say it was it was rad. I was all for that. Um, boards are nice. Inset player boards. Thank you. I love inset player boards. But then box insert, and this is one I found surprising. I think we had a conversation about this. This is Pandasaurus Games. This is the company that makes Wasteland Express Delivery Service. Wasteland Express Delivery Service, the game that has the best insert I have ever seen with a place for everything and everything in its place and individual player board. It's amazing. And then you have this game that came with a cardboard insert at the bottom that once I had the entire game punched, I could not fit all the components back in the box. Now, when I got the box, I showed this in the in the unboxing video, the lid didn't fit when you got it. And I assumed that if you punched everything, once the car extra cardboard was gone, you'd be able to shut it. No, I could not fit everything back in the box. I Googled it. There was one guy that had one solution that if you put everything just right, you can make it fit. And I tried that, but I want to bag my components so that the, the startup setup is shorter because, man, that setup is terrible. And no, like, like Pandasaurus, come on. Like maybe it just was a stretch goal they didn't get to. I don't know what it was. Component quality though, overall, except for the lack of an insert. And, and like, I've played this game once and I don't know my feelings on it. It definitely wasn't amazing. I got to play again, but I am interested in playing again, but I'm like tempted to go buy like a $40 box insert just so next time it's not so annoying. Unfortunately, uh, the one I'm seeing right now, which is a really nice looking one, is closer to $60. But Oh, there you go. Yeah. I'm definitely not spending 40 No, I'm pr probably not going to spend either. Yeah, store, I, I, wait, store bro all Broken the... token. Yeah, store if you all are the... listening to the show. I was looking at store all the bits on Etsy. So they've got they've got a really nice one, but it's pricey. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to get a hold of Broken Token if you're listening and you want someone to review your Dinosaur Island insert, assuming you have one, you can send that to Mo at tabletopbellhop.com. And then we can show off just how much quicker we can set the game up. So yeah, I kind of got on a tangent there about silly inserts from companies that are known to have good inserts. Uh, the last big game of the week for me, uh, this was Saturday. Game night's done. It's the next day. I am at home, and this was special for me. And that is because it's one of those few proud dad moments where I sat down at my dining room table, and my eight-year-old daughter taught me one of her games she got for Christmas. And that game was Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Now, she played before at the Gaming in the New Year party uh, with Sean, actually, who taught a group of gamers that night. But I'd yet to play the game myself. And since I hadn't played before, we decided to reboot the game back to game one. So we started out just the two of us. I played Harry Potter. She played Hermione. Now, 
I totally get why she did that. And my daughter immediately went to Hermione and my son went to Harry Potter. <laughs> um, long-term game goals, just for anyone listening, uh, I do recommend that somebody always play Neville. Just really? To sugge- just a suggestion. Someone should always play Neville. Uh, it doesn't <laughs> I almost matter. Picked Neville. It doesn't actually matter in the first two games, uh, but Neville is uh, is becomes an important character to the playing of the game. Life, in in my opinion. Interesting. Good to know. I almost grabbed Neville, but I'm like, I don't know. It's a you got to have Harry. It's the Harry Potter game. Yeah, Someone's no, got to play. Him. Absolutely. Especially what I, what I strongly consi- considered doing was each playing two characters, but then I thought that might be a bit much for her. Though she had played before, maybe that would have worked. So overall, I have heard many, many people in my Twitter feed on Board Game Geek, on various podcasts, complain this game's too simple. And after playing book one, I guess I can see it. Like, it's simple enough, but it doesn't seem overly simple. Like, it's a, it's a solid deck builder. Uh, it's got two resources, which is more than Dominion. Uh, you've got to manage both your influence and whatever you, the, the lightning bolts you attack people with. I don't remember what that's I, called. I call them strikes. I don't even know what they call them. I just call them strikes. Yeah, I can't, influence is the money. I don't know why that sticks in my head. but uh, So you got two things to track. So this is more like Star Realms or Ascension level. It's also got the rotating pool you buy from. Again, Star Realms Ascension versus, say, Dominium, where everything's the same. Um, the way you attack bad guys reminds me of the DC games, the, the Cerebus engine from... Cryptozoic, where you're playing co-op and you're trying to beat up DC superheroes or Naruto or whatever. Uh, It was like all of those kind of combined with the Harry Potter theme. I liked it. Uh, It was simple, but it seemed to be the perfect difficulty for someone new to deck building. Especially, like, I couldn't tell you if this is targeted at kids or not, but it's ages 11 and up. Like, I, I... I have to assume that there are kids who are going to be into it. And again, 11 and up, so it says in the box, but I'm pretty sure, I don't know, with with little G, I'm not sure. I think she would have a hard time handling that many cards at once. She can now read and handing her one card. I'm sure she can read one card and do what one card says, but having five may be a bit much for her. But any nine, eight, depending, as long as your kids can read, I could see them being able to get this game. The mechanics are basic. I liked it. Um, The one thing I did like, though, was the way it's like a legacy game and the way the game grows as you play. Like if you fail book one, you just play book one again and you keep playing it until you beat it. And then when you beat it, you open book two and book two is like a box, right? Like kind of basically, uh, like I said, a legacy game. You don't rip anything up. You don't ruin your copy, which is why we were able to reboot it. Uh, Now, book two didn't unlock much. You got new locations and basically more of everything, more cards, more cards in the in the bad guy deck, more cards in the in the good the good guy deck. I don't I forget what the the, I'm trying a total blank, the Hogwarts deck. Try remember the bad guy, the dark arts, dark arts deck. I couldn't remember the name of that. And then new villains. And then what makes it hard is with the villains, you add those to the villains you had to beat the first time. And that makes it significantly harder than the first book. For example, we got to check out the stun rules for the first time playing book two, which I thought was interesting because Big G noted that she thinks you guys were playing wrong on New Year's Eve with stun. And I'm wondering if that may be why you were having difficulty with book five. What uh, did she, what what does she think we were doing wrong? Because I'm pretty sure we're... Okay, she said when you got stunned, you lose all your cards, you go down to zero health, you miss your turn, you go back up to full health. No, we weren't doing that. <laughs> okay, no, it's, you lose, you, you, lose half, you lose half your cards, and at the end yep. of that that turn, you go back up to full health. At but you still what? get your turn. She didn't think yeah, you yeah. get your turn. No, no. Yeah. So I, she just misunderstood. Yeah, no, I wasn't sure. I know you've had some difficulty on the later book, so I thought, hey, maybe we found something you were doing wrong that might help you. Out. Oh well, yep. it's worth a shot. Uh, so you're, you're talking about ages. Uh, my youngest is nine. He loves the game. Uh, now, one thing I find is. Um, they quickly memorize, if they're familiar with the movies, they memorize the spell names and associate that with the rules. So once they've read them once or twice, they quickly are, oh, I want to have that spell. Oh, I want to have that spell. And and it becomes, uh, because it's so familiar to them uh, that way, that uh, they really seem to uh, handle it well. Cool. So having played the two books now, uh, we did win book two. We could have moved on to book three, but we didn't have time. Uh, I got to say, overall, I'm impressed. Uh, more importantly, though, Big G seems to love it. 
Uh, she loves having a game to teach me that you could tell from her she was proud of that too, right? And she loves working together to beat the game. So I am looking forward to book three. At some point, I'm going to try to get um, entry games in as well. So we play three player. And maybe next year, I don't know, at some point we'll bring little G in, but not yet. She's not quite at that level yet. Now, I know Sean's probably sick of always sitting and listening to me talk during this segment. So he's been trying to get more games in himself. So what do we got? Well, my clan got our own Hogwarts play in, uh, and I must say that the learning curve spikes at book five. No question about it. That <laughs> is the, the game changer. Uh, three plays of book five now and no luck for us. Uh, and there is literally one card that gets added in at that point, and I don't want to do any spoilers, but that's what shifts the balance. It's what really takes the game into that this is a hard game now level. Interesting. Yeah, from what I've been seeing on my Twitter feed, you aren't the only one. I, like, I think I saw three different people comment about book five when I shared that I was playing book three. And one person I remember noted, it's tough. Another one was like, man, we're stuck on book five. And then a third was like, our game stalled out at book five. So five does seem to be the the uh, stepping stone or the, the wall, the, the block for most people. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, and I have to say, I even actually tried stacking the deck once and it still didn't matter. Huh. Um, wow. Yeah. The, the second time through, after seeing what happened the first time, I tried to do something a little easier for my kids um, because they immediately had noticed what it was that, that caused the, the spike. Um, so I, I, I just did my own little shuffle for them and we still didn't win it. So it's wow. it's definitely something uh, that you just sort of have to, to plan around and focus and find that one trick. I, I guess maybe we haven't found it yet. Um, but next up, after waiting three months for delivery, my copy of The Duke had finally uh, showed up over the holidays. Uh, now, my son was homesick last week. He's better now. But while he was on the mend, we took out that, put it on the table. My son loves chess. And I felt bad because I hate chess. Just can't stand it. Uh, but he always wanted to play. And there was only so much enjoyment he was getting out of playing various apps on the uh, iPad with it. Uh, the Duke, though, I find is very chess-like, but it's got enough difference and, and extra to it that it, it really has that grab for me. Um, so it went well. Uh, we had uh, four games, and we're actually tied to two games apiece. So nice. he picked it up fast. Now, you have a different version than I have. It's like uh, the Duke something edition or uh, something yeah, like we got, that. Yeah, uh, I picked up the deluxe edition, I guess it is. And what it comes with is it has the Arthurian expansion okay. uh, that comes with it. Uh, the game, you know, the game to me, it seems exactly piecewise and everything else seems exactly like the one you, I played at your place. Uh, the only okay. thing I'm not a big fan of, and I expect it will wear itself in, is the board doesn't lay flat. And that's oh, God. frustrating. So it's gonna. I think it's going to work itself in. But the way it was cut and folded means it, it tents a little bit. Um, and that that's a, a frustrating little thing that I hope will... I, I might just need to throw out a couple of my wife's uh, medical dictionaries on it and <laughs> weigh it down for a while. So mine doesn't have that problem. I don't know. Maybe they changed the, the look or the binding or something since the, uh, the original printing. Right. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. Thanks to our moderator, Angie Games. Tonight, we've got Shadzar here in the, there talking about uh, various things. We've got, uh, we're up to seven viewers now, and I, we've seen Red Ketchup FBI dropped in, dropped us some bits, and... Uh, That's awesome. Had some comments. We've got Darkling Blight in there, and uh, Major Kayla is here with us tonight as well. So thank you very much for everyone. Uh, I apologize if I don't say your name, but I always have trouble just differentiating between bot and not bot. So yeah. <laughs> there's a, we could there's go a through the full list. Is, is that something people would dig? You guys in the chat, if you like having your name called out, is that something you want to see? Like we can pretty easily just bring up the user list and fire through it and be like, hey, thanks for joining us. Bang, 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 bang. If that's something you want to hear or not, I have no problem doing it. Or Sean has no problem doing it. Yeah, no, not at <laughs> Either all. way. If people like hearing their name, we're cool with doing that. At this point, I usually stick to the people who are uh, talking, interacting, and actually saying things. Though I do appreciate people watching us either way, whether you talk or not, or you're off cooking dinner while we're doing the show. I know at least one person is doing that. Absolutely. Um, so any, so any actual comments, anything come up? Well, we've had uh, 
you know, Shadzar was mentioning that all the bad things happen to Neville uh, in the game, in the <laughs> books, and that's that's very true. But uh, uh, some of his uh, development in the game really sort of makes it for a uh, a beneficial character to have uh, in there. Okay. So we've got. I gotta that. admit, I was I wasn't a big fan of Harry Potter's cards. Like as far as I can tell, there's just the two cards that make each character yeah. unique, and his were like meh. Well, to be so honest, I, I was thinking of trying a different character. I mean, Harry next gets time the invisibility like, cloak. Meh. Harry gets the invisibility cloak. Oh, the, and yeah, that you is, only take one damage. That is kind of the strongest early game thing uh, along. Um, that's that's a very powerful uh, thing. No, it, it's it's actually. He Book one and two, there was only one villain that ever did two damage, so it was yeah. like, eh. Yeah, there's there's a couple of there's a couple of dark arts cards that you pull at the start at the start of each turn that can do two, but okay. generally no. Early again, it's uh, it's it's not it doesn't it comes out later on, but because you've got it from the beginning, it's it's a it's a super powerful thing. But no, uh, in your next book, when you get into book three, ne uh, Neville's evolution, um, okay, uh, is 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 a, a big help on the table. Very cool. All right, as usual, if you do have comments, we will be checking back in with the lobby later in the show. One of the things we have updated in our format is more check-ins. So we want to interact with you if you're here to see us. Uh, I just, uh, I, I think we're having a good stream. Uh, a good stream. Shadzar was having some um, complaints about the front end, pro uh, but that was uh, that was Twitch's problem, not ours. I tweaked our good. settings and 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 sort of adapted little things to try and. Uh, reduce our possible drop frame rate and i on my end it's working so i hope it's working yep. well on the stream as well yeah my lag seems pretty good like when i'm looking at the chat i can see our live and i'm not far behind so it's yeah good. i i've kind of i just kind of tweaked it to find a better balance between frame rate we i mean we're not playing a video game so we don't need friction 60 frames per second um so i dropped that down and balanced out our uh, our rate cool sounds good excellent now we can only grow through the support of fans like you. Please take a minute to subscribe to our content wherever you find us and help us share our gaming advice to the world. What is it? Uh, I always forget the, the four like, share, favorite, something like that. Yeah. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your email inbox. Once a week, I will be sending out an email recapping all of the content we've released in the week previous up until that day. No, before that day. Not up until that day. Up until the day previous. No, maybe it's up till that day. Whatever. I'm going to tell you everything we did in the last week since the last email. Whatever that, whenever that happens to come out. Uh, blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, anything else we create, it will be there in the newsletter. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and I'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Almost tripped all over that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excuse me. I am going to take a quick drink of water because my voice is starting to die today for some reason. I'll do the bell again so it'll be easier to cut that. <laughs> During our Hindsight, Foresight, New Year's Eve episode, our New Year's episode, I guess it was also a New Year's Eve episode, looked back, looked forward, looked down, looked up, I don't know. Uh, I talked about how one of my gaming resolutions for the year was to try to seriously reduce my pile of shame, or I should say piles of shame. Now, a pile of shame, for those who don't know the term, is that collection of games you spent your hard-earned gaming budget on but still haven't actually gotten to the table and played. It includes stuff you were super excited about and rushed out to buy or kickstarted, pre-ordered, and then just never played once it showed up. Mm -hmm. It includes those games you bought on a whim due to a good sale or on an impulse buy at your local FLGS. It includes games you picked up last weekend at the FLGS as well as that one game you've now owned for three years but somehow never managed to get to the table. You're talking about me specifically now, aren't you? I feel attacked. <laughs> now, I know many people don't like using the word shame. I, they prefer to have their shelf of opportunity or their pile of gaming potential. Personally, I like shame. Well, okay, that sounded weird. But I like the term shame. Uh, these games are shameful. They sit there mocking me for buying them and not playing them. Or they're like, this person gave you this gift. They were considerate and you haven't even played it. You should feel shameful. I spent money on them and there they sit doing nothing. 
And like the bellhops law, right? The best games are the ones that get played. Well, I guess these aren't the best games because they're not getting played. And now to be fair, as we've mentioned previously, you don't just buy games madly, regard madly regardless of time to play. Some of these yeah. came from the generosity of friends after a business ventures had failed. Yeah, I'm not going to get into the details, but there is a reason. My my piles of shame spiked last year due to specific circumstances. Uh, if you follow along on the blog, you know all about it. I'm not going to get into it here. So while talking about doing this, right, here's my plan for, for 2019. And to stick to it, to have some accountability, to get it out there so that you can hold me accountable on this. And she games and I sat around and came up with the hashtag, less shame, more game. So, you know, pound, less shame, more game. For anyone who's over the under the age of thirty pound is what we used to call hashtag. Uh, for we're gonna call that that that's their hashtag we're gonna use for this quest this quest to reduce our pile of shame. I'm going to be using that hashtag throughout the year as I get some of these games these unplayed games played. So even this weekend when we were at the game store, when I was sharing that I played games that came out the pile, I used the hashtag. I encourage you our listeners and viewers to join in on the challenge and use that hashtag too. Again, pound hashtag, whatever you want to call it. Tic-tac-toe board, less shame, more game. And I would love to see my Twitter feed and social media slowly fill up with that tag, right? Like I've already put, I, I use tweet deck instead of just Twitter raw. Right. And I've got a search for that hashtag and I keep hoping to see someone else use it. I want to see more people getting on board this boat, trying to get those unplayed games played and heck you can even call them your shelf of opportunity or whatever you want. I'm not going to blame you, even though you're going to use the hashtag has the word shame in it. Oh, well less, less uh, opportunity, more games just doesn't sound as cool. Now, on our video broadcasts, you'll get the current total up there in the top left-hand corner, and we'll be adjusting that as games come and go between and during episodes. That way. For podcasts, I'll summarize it in the intro. I always forget my video swap. I'm like, I don't know, it looks like it's over there. No, it's over there. The bookcases are actually on my right. It messes me up every time. So over at TabletopBellhop.com, I posted my current pile of shame list, my my list of shameful games uh this was done on january 5th when i published the article then i had 79 different games and expansions on my piles as of right now i played three of them all of which we just talked about during the week in review during tabletop gaming weekly uh the prelude expansion for terraforming mars dinosaur island and harry potter hogwarts battle so now i'm down to 76 The pile the of shame. The problem is that my birthday hit last week, and I got Bandu, and I got War Chest, and then while we were at, uh, little, uh while we were at uh, CG Realm, I hooked up with Ross, who was selling part of his collection, and I managed to buy a copy of Kodama often for ten bucks. Now Kodama's fantastic, and ten bucks is a fantastic price for that game. So what is that? Uh, it's one, two, three. So now we have three games onto the pile. So I guess I'm back to 79. The pile of shame. So going forward throughout the year, I'll be doing uh, less shame, more game check-ins. Probably about once a month, probably at the end of the month. Um, I'll put up uh, a, a blog post. I'll probably list all the games I got off the pile. I'll probably do a short review as well. And I'll publish a new list, right? Here's where I stand. And then while we're doing the Tabletop Gaming Weekly segment every podcast, I'll be more cognizant of it and know when I play games for the first time and they get off the piles. So let's all work on not having a big number looming over any of us just like this. Now, every episode, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to the tabletop.com, tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. So social media, of course, works as well. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Uh, while I prefer questions come in through the website, that's much easier for me to track them that way. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Today on Ask the Bellhop, we've got a blue plate special, a two-for-one meal deal where we answer two of your food-related questions. Now, you may or may not know this, but one of my other hats I wear is uh, 
a hobby food blogger where I write under the moniker Big Dude Loves Food, which you can find at bigdudefood, one word, dot blogspot, dot com. I dig food a lot. I like eating well. Uh, if you When you first started, if you watch episode one of the podcast, you can probably tell I liked eating well. I like trying new things. I love checking out new restaurants and I love discovering local delicacies. And when I go on vacation, there's two things I spend a lot of time Googling. One is local game stores. The second is places to eat. I would say I'm a foodie, but not really a food snob. I just like to have good food. Uh, My reviews are more of an everyman kind of thing. I'm just a big dude who likes to eat good food. So this top subject is, I got to say, pretty close to my heart, or at least my stomach. Order up. Drew Sanderson asks, game night food etiquette. How important is it? Uh, Thanks for the question, Drew. I've got mixed feelings about food and gaming. While I love food and I love gaming, I personally prefer to keep the two apart, at least somewhat. Like the perfect day for me, like this is like the ultimate, this is an awesome day. This is what we tried to do for our launch party, basically. This is this is this is my perfect day would be meeting some friends for lunch uh, at the local ramen pop-up shop, having some amazing ramen, then heading from there to the local game store, playing some games there, having a great time playing games with my friends, and then leaving and going to a local pizzeria and having some of that amazing Windsor style pizza. So we all sit down, we've all gained, we're talking about the games, we're having some amazing pizza. Then we head back to my place and we have play more gaming. So I prefer to have my food and gaming separate like this. I like food, I like gaming, but I would rather break it up so that there's separate things, even if it's with the same people. Uh, so the further apart in time and space you uh, have your food and games, the less risk of getting Cheeto dust on the, that game and ruining your pieces. <laughs> Very true. So that said, I do sometimes have snacks at the table. Uh, it's not normal. Like I know a lot of people always have bowls of chips or whatever. I, we don't tend to have snacks at the game table, but we do for big events like our gaming in the New Year party we did on New Year's Eve, where uh, not only did we have snacks, we actually ordered in food. Now, added to that, I have been to many game nights that feature food. It seems to be something people do like to mix together. Anytime I have been over to Charles' place, there is food involved. His wife brings down food. They order in food. Uh, The one time I went to, oh, whatever, I've been to other local gamers' houses, and it tends to be part of the event. So it's definitely a thing. Uh, People do dig it. So I will give you some of my thoughts on combining your love of food and your love of gaming. So step one goes right to what Sean just said. Pick the right foods. Avoid those Cheetos. Some foods definitely go better with games than others. You want to avoid greasy, powdery, saucy, sticky foods. And also, of course, be careful with those beverages. Skip the wings and ribs and have coasters handy if you can. Resealable beverages are even better. Very true, though. I don't know many people have reseal. I guess pop and water bottles. You don't see a lot of resealable beverages at the table, but that's a good call. It's not one I thought of. Travel the travel big... mugs are, are fantastic. True, true. So the big thing is you don't want anything to get on a player's hands and then get from those hands onto your game components or someone's game components. It doesn't have to be your game, anyone's game components. Now, this is just as true for full meals as for snacks. Right, Save the smart food popcorn and Doritos for snack time in front of the TV. When you're going to sit and watch Netflix, then you pull out the smart food. And I swear smart food is worse than Doritos. Unless you love your couch as much as your games, then even that might be smart food free. That's true. I I have been to houses. There's a 70s thing, right? The old uh, couch with the plastic still on it and they never remove it. I guess you're allowed to eat Cheetos on that couch. (laughs) <laughs> so the other thing to consider is if people are playing and eating at once, this is something you may not consider, uh, they want to be able to do both. They want to be able to eat and they want to be able to play at once. Now, while a nice big plate of spaghetti might sound great, you're going to need somewhere to put that plate down and you're going to need somewhere to have your nice big spoon and your fork to be able to twirl that spaghetti. That's not going to work so great at the game table. It's going to take up too much room and your hands are going to be busy trying to slurp up spaghetti. You're probably better off with finger foods and things that can be eaten with one hand and even better, not actually have to be put down. Now, I got to say, this is probably why pizza is so popular at game night, but watch for the extra greasy pizza. There are few things worse than greasy hands holding cards. Sleeved or not, it still makes my skin crawl. Yeah. 
So the other thing you got to think about is who's going to be eating your food, right? This is just common courtesy. Think of dietary restrictions. Is your friend on a keto diet? Is his girlfriend vegan? Does someone at the table have milk allergies? Or is there someone like me who just cannot stand mushrooms? Uh, think ahead. Think to ask this stuff ahead of time. And if you can't ask ahead of time, make sure there's a variety of options where possible. How you're managing your game nights makes a big difference here. Facebook or meetup groups versus just texting or calling people can help coordinate everyone better for all aspects of your gaming night. Yeah, I got to say with with social media nowadays, it's kind of it's so easy to get information to a group of people before an event. They like use it. The tools are there. So even when choosing the most game friendly foods, accidents will happen. So the other thing you want to do if it's at your house or you're playing your games or you're bringing the games is protect those games. Right. I, I'm terrible for this. I will admit it. But you really should sleeve your cards. Now, again, I don't usually combine food and gaming, so it makes a little sense. But if you're going to especially sleeving is just so simple. Right. I uh, consider picking up a laminator like they are dirt cheap nowadays. Uh, the Amazon Basics one, I think, is 20 bucks. That's crazy. And they work great for protecting your character sheets, thin player boards, summary sheets, your dungeon tiles, uh, pretty much anything thin. You can even uh, if you go to. Like staples and that, some of them can even laminate thicker things like boards. The other thing, though, is I have seen Snakes and Lattes does this, and I don't want to recommend a brand, but you can spray varnish your game boards. At one time, I do remember recommending Tester's Dull Coat, but someone got back to me that over time that does yellow. So it might be worth trying to get a hold of Snakes and Lattes to find it out. But they are a game cafe where lots of people are using their games, and they literally spray varnish every board and every component. They spray varnish their meeple so that they can be easily washed afterwards. Uh, again, I don't want to recommend a brand. I don't want you ruining uh, the one trick, because I used to be a miniature painter, is always make a test piece, right? Keep a, keep a piece of the, the, the cardboard that you punched everything out of and try it on the cardboard first. Uh, if there are gaming cafes in your area, stop by and check out how they might protect their different types of games. Uh, hopefully they've thought of this in advance, at least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will I will admit I've been to game cafes that have done absolutely nothing to sort protect their, their games. Uh, it's, maybe they're just planning on buying extra copies. I'm not sure. So the next step from this, almost like something to think about if you're going to have food and gaming happening regularly in your home or in your place or in your store or in your cafe is to have a food friendly gaming space have coasters really simple have somewhere for people to put their drinks down and make sure you i don't know if you, they cost more but get the type that have lips right so if something does spill it doesn't spill all over the table. Hopefully it gets caught mostly by the coaster. Because one of the things I find a lot of people don't think about grabbing that can of Coke and bringing it downstairs from the fridge is that stuff sweats. So even if you don't spill anything, you're going to get condensation on the outside and the coaster is going to catch that. Coasters are big. Uh, make sure you have paper towels, napkins on hand. Uh, one of the things I've used to do, I'm not as good at it because I tend to have the same people at my house. If someone new comes to my house, I point out, hey, the napkins are here just in case, right? I uh, have that there. Have plates, right? So people have somewhere to put the stuff so they're not holding it in their hands, right? If you're going to do cheese and crackers, like so the guy's not holding his greasy cheese in his hand, eating it, it's on a plate. Yeah, you're still going to touch it, but come on. Though the biggest tip, though, possibly for this entire segment is to use end tables, side tables, uh, TV trays. I use TV trays. You want to keep the game on the main table, but have side tables for everything else, for your food and drink, right? This way, if something does tip or spill or a glass gets knocked over, the only thing getting messed up is that side table. And well, maybe your game room floor. My personal game room floor is linoleum. I got nothing to worry about. I just mop that up. Uh, like I said, TV trays are great, end tables. I personally have four folding TV trays that when it's New Year's or a big party night when there's going to be food, I kind of put at the four corners of the table and let people move around and people share them. I can't recommend this enough. Like this to me is even better than the coasters and everything else because there's no way your game's going to get ruined except for maybe people's greasy fingers. Another uh, great tip for beverages, if they are going to be on the table, uh, big rolls of tape. Um... They're often what we use at the tech table if we're on productions. You can't afford to co spill your coffee on a $20,000 or more lighting console. Um, put it in a tape roll and it's almost impossible <laughs> to knock over. Uh, the there other thing that I was thinking as, as you were talking was uh, garbage. 
Uh, because I know this yes. is actually a bit of a problem at your place. Your garbage yep. is very discreetly hidden away, and it's in a fantastic mm -hmm. place, except... <laughs> 90% of the people don't actually know where you've hidden it away so discreetly. Uh, so if you can have a garbage can out for people to, uh, you know, especially if you're having a large group over, just make it easier for people to throw throw their garbage away because people want to. Um, yeah. But if they aren't sure where the garbage is, that's where things get stuck on the shelf for Anchi Games to find. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, I'm like, I'm like if Anchi Games could hear, well, she could hear if she's listening, she's in the chat. But if she was here live, she would tell you, stories of how people like to squirrel things away on my game shelves yeah that's a good point yeah have garbage available i'll be sean's right i'm not good at it we have one of those like wooden ones where you pull out the drawer and it's nice and out of the way and i've got one of the two of the piles of shame on top of it right now actually but yeah have, have the garbage out even like halfway through uh eating just go upstairs well go wherever here it's upstairs grab a big garbage bag bring it downstairs makes perfect sense it's a it's a good call <clears throat> All right, order up. Ivan Sorensen asks, what is the best way to organize the food run so it doesn't cut into game time? Uh, it's all about pre-planning. This, this is uh, plan your event. Uh, don't be spontaneous. This is not a place to improvise. You want to make sure everyone who's at your game night knows the plan before they show up, going in. They, they need to know. I mentioned earlier, use email, use Facebook, uh, meet together, face-to-face -face discussions, whatever. There's so many ways to get a hold of people. Start start a group on Messenger so you can just chat one person, everyone gets it. There, there's no, no excuse nowadays to not talk about it ahead of time. I guess the only way that, that you might not be able to get this out is if it's a new event, you have new people coming. But even then, this kind of stuff should be on your poster or your event page. It's like people should know ahead of time that there's going to be a meal what to expect from that meal, like what kind of food, is it snacks, is it a meal, uh, and what time it's going to happen. Because people need to know things like if you're all ordering pizza, is the host paying for the pizza or do you guys need to bring money? Or how much food does the person who's going to order need to order, right? And who's in, who's out, right? Because I know at our events, Charles never gets in on pizza. I don't know if Charles, no, I've seen Charles eat pizza, whatever. Charles never gets in on pizza. Never does. But Chris Ball will split a pizza with me every single event. And I know exactly what he wants on his pizza. And I know at our event, me and him are splitting a pizza while other people do it. So they're definitely, uh, you want to talk about it. You want to talk about it ahead of time. And everyone should know going in. If you ask a group of people, so what do you want to eat? You have likely just killed a significant portion of your gaming time. Uh, it yeah. doesn't work. I am bad enough, and I admit I am bad for doing this. We set the time we're going to order, but then we order pizza, and we probably lose about half an hour every year going, okay, what do you want on it? Okay, what do you want on it? Okay, what do you want on it? So that's something we should do better. Now everyone knows we're ordering pizza. They know we're getting Windsor-style pizza. They know we're getting large pizzas, and you're pairing with someone else, and they know how much money to bring. So all that's covered, but we are bad about figuring out who's getting what at the time. So... Personally, I prefer delivery. Like at, at this point, you got a bunch of people at your house who wants to leave, who wants to go get food. So I go with delivery. Now, this seems to surprise some people, and I'm not sure why it does, but almost every delivery place will deliver at a set time. Like you don't have to call them when you're hungry and have them bring it when it's ready. You can call the day before and say, hey, we want five pizzas at 7 p.m. at this address. And places are actually happier to do that because they can plan ahead. So this is something like just call long enough ahead. You don't necessarily have to call it an hour or a day ahead, but like call two hours in advance. Or if your game night's starting at five and you want the food at seven before everyone shows up at five call. Or if your game night's starting at five, you want the food at seven. When everyone gets there right at five, that's when you decide what toppings are going on the pizza then you call this should all be part of your event planning something that happens before the event or at the beginning of the event now if someone is going to pick stuff up again you can make it happen at a set time not only can you say hey dave at seven you're going to run out and get the food but you can call ahead and say hey um penalty box i want 17 chicken delights can you have that ready for 7 p.m and coordinate it between the restaurant and you most places are really cool for that just remember to account for driving time like the person's got to leave, go drive there, pay, load up their car, whatever, and come back. Uh, hopefully a couple other people go with them to help carry stuff, right? So now in most places, uh, as Major Kayla has pointed out in the chat, you've got newer services like Skip the Dishes, Uber Eats, and others. Now this allows you to even pass around a device and let people order themselves, if you can work out the payment that way, or for everyone to order their own. 
Uh, just be mm -hmm. aware that this can be a pricey option, so make sure everyone is clear on how payment is going to work in advance. Now, uh, skip the dishes here in Windsor. The highest delivery cost is five bucks. So no matter how big your order is, so it's it's actually not that bad here. Now Uber Eats, we don't. Well, as far as I know, we don't have locally. I I still most of the time just call the places. So the whole point of all this, right? All this pre-planning, you're doing this so you can plan the gaming around the food, right? So if you know game night starts at five and you got the pizzas coming at seven, you got two hours to play games, right? Makes perfect sense. I can play two one-hour games or I can play a two-hour game and then it's going to be time to eat, which brings me back to the fact you don't have to play and eat at the same time. For me, when the food shows up, that's when you take a break, right? You step back, you stop whatever you're playing, you enjoy the meal with your friends. Put the dice down, pick up a plate, talk about how the game night's been going. Maybe you talk about what you want to play next, or you discuss strategies for what you're going to do next in Gloomhaven so you don't lose on Mission 10 again. Uh, maybe you take a total break from gaming, and you talk about the new Spider-Man trailer. Like, personally, I find these breaks are great for breaking up a long event. Everyone, like, we're all gamers. We all love to game, but gaming for 12 hours at a time, the gaming may get less fun by the end of that 12 hours and unless you're doing something like an extra life charity event where you're trying to strive to get those hours in it's meant to be fun right well not that extra life's not meant to be fun but you like take a break it's not going to hurt this gives everyone a chance to relax which is especially useful if you're playing heavier games it gives people a chance to use the washroom get a no drink go for a smoke check on the family check your twitter feed whatever uh, depending on your game room setup, this could be a great time to throw on some YouTube while folks eat. Maybe a let's play of a new game you're going to be teaching or a review, or even just a couple of guys chatting about gaming and <laughs> answering your questions. <laughs> There's a way to go. We, we want to be your food break show. That, that'll be our new angle. Cute. <laughs> so getting back to the original topic of etiquette, going back to the original question, all the rules for eating, the, like I shouldn't have to say this, but like all the rules for eating with other humans applies like be courteous, don't try to hog the food. Um, there was a gamer locally who pointed out that they would skip lunch because their GM was bringing snacks and that they planned that as their dinner for the night. Like, don't do that. Don't eat your pizza nice and quick and burn the top of your mouth just for that chance you get one extra slice. Like, come on, bring money. If you know you're going to be splitting on food, I don't know how many times over the years we're like, we're ordering pizza, we're ordering pizza, we're ordering pizza. Oh, I want in on pizza. Okay, it's seven bucks each. Oh, I didn't bring any money. Like, come on. Be better than that. And so on, right? All the rules for visiting a friend's house for dinner apply to game night. Just because you're playing games doesn't mean you throw the rest of the stuff out of the window. Not being cool about food is a great way to make sure you're not invited to any future events. Yeah, and again, back to the advanced planning. Not only the planner, but those attending need to make sure that they are both aware and speak up if they have any concerns or requirements. If you're the only vegan and order a special pizza just for you, don't expect to pay the same as everyone else who's splitting a pizza three ways. Very true. I've seen that one over the years, too. So that's a whole bunch of my thoughts on how to combine food with gaming. But now I want to take it to the next level, right? Here, here's the next level tip. Here's how to level it up. Let's, let's uh, to get the emerald where, bam, we're going to kick this up a notch. Tie the game and the food together with a theme. How cool would this game night be, right? You have a Japanese-themed game night where the pile of games includes Takedo, uh, Takenoko, Shogun, and Yido. Uh, you're going to put on Kurosawa soundtracks playing quietly in the background. And after the second game of the night, you pause and all sit down and have some Shio ramen before finishing the night off with the last two games. I I'm totally up for this. We, we have to do this. So it sounds like a plan. Uh, my birthday is the week after Breakout Con. Uh... Just saying. There we go. <laughs> we, we could totally do this. Uh, all right. So we've had uh, a little bit of chat going on in the lobby. Uh, Major awesome. Kayla and uh, Shadzar are both uh, chatting. We've got a lot of food topic. There's uh, never a shortage of people willing to talk about food. Uh, apparently, smart food is Canadian. I, I wasn't aware. Really? That, I wasn't aware, but uh, it seems to be that people don't know that elsewhere. And oh. when I Google it, it's a .ca website. So... Wow. Uh, smart food is pop uh, a bag of popcorn, uh, and the default flavor is a white powdery uh, cheddar, white, white cheddar, cheddar. Uh, that gets on everything. I mean, it is the glitter oh, of of snack food. <laughs> yeah, like like Doritos have nothing on smart food. That and the smart, you just gets thick. 
Like after you're done eating smart food, your fingers are about a quarter inch thicker. Like yeah. it just kind of piles on. It's it's insane. <laughs> uh, and Major Kale is pointing out uh, you can PayPal each other if you don't happen to have cash. Uh, and there's a few other different options out there for for cash sharing uh, apps and, and ways of, of tip, sort of tipping back and forth between each other to settle bills. Um, See, that's cool. But again, set it up ahead of time. Not everyone has a PayPal account. Yep, yep. Uh, and then uh, Shazar has brought up something called Treat Stream, which okay. is a Streamlabs for food. Um, so apparently okay. you can actually uh, set up a menu choices and locations in advance and get people to donate food to you from that pre-curated list. Um, hey, we might have to figure this out for New Year's next year. Well, I, I'm thinking New Year's. I mean, Extra Life. I mean, gamers could actually, you know, eat at Extra Life. On, oh, uh, that would be cool. Get get the stuff brought in to, yeah. to CG. So we'll have to see that if, that's a, cool. if, if that's an option in, in Canada. Oh, and, and Angie Games is looking at the uh, FAQs right now. So uh, oh, cool. we'll, we'll have to keep that in this uh, list. Uh, also, going back a little bit more to uh, your gloss coats, uh, Tester's gloss coat and dull coat will yellow with age, as yeah, our mentions. I've been hearing that. Um, I have been hearing that. But I got to admit, I got, I got dull coated miniatures up here from 1980-something, and they, they haven't yellowed at all. They look still look fine. So I don't know. And then uh, he's mentioning if you want to protect minis, don't varnish. Use uh, resin coating instead. I, so. That sounds like a troll comment to me. I don't know if that's true. Are you going to Mod Podge a mini and just goop it all on? I don't know about <laughs> that one. I, I could be wrong. I haven't painted miniatures in a long time, as you just saw from the 1980s miniature. And we have confirmed Treat Stream is available in Canada. Oh, uh, we sounds cool. We might, we might have some options here. This is this is good. Um there was, there was... I, I like the concept. If people can bring us, uh, like, I don't know, we, we must have mentioned it, but uh, one of the, the good local pizza places that makes Windsor-style pizza last year uh, didn't donate. They, they sold us pizza at cost and cut it into large slices for us to sell at the event. So we made money on it, right? Um, we did pay for it. They also gave us a gift card. The thing is, that place burned down since the last event, so I don't know if Franco's will be helping us again. Or, um, yeah, Franco's will be helping us again. I know they're repairing, but yeah, it was an awesome, awesome donation. Like that, we could. What Jeremy kept calling it wedding pizza, because I guess when you go to a wedding reception, you have dinner, and there's cake and dancing. But for the people who stay at midnight, you order in pizza, and that's just for the people who have been drinking all night. I guess it's a thing. I don't remember that happening at any wedding I went to. My wedding, I had pizza but that was for dinner. So <laughs> that's a little different. Uh, yeah. I wonder if, I wonder if we can get uh, the, the Windsor sandwich cafe on a treat stream and that way you can actually donate. Well, that would be cool. That would be, that would be awesome. So you could actually donate food from that, from, from the, uh, the store to players. Um, yeah, that, that would be cool. Uh, and Chad Zar is mentioning, there are a bunch of food grade resins that you can use that shouldn't yellow. So uh, that's certainly something to, to look into. For uh, for coding and protecting things. Sounds uh, good. All right. Well, that was a great talk. If you'd like to read more on this topic, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you'll see this and other questions answered in blog form. Send your questions over on the website under Ask the Bellhop or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Patreon patrons at the good tip or better level get their questions bumped to the top of the question list once a month. Speaking of our Patreon, a shout out and a thank you to our backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Misdirected Mark, join Phil, Chris, Bob, and now Camden every Tuesday night at 845 Eastern, 645 Queens time as they talk games <laughs> and game mastering. Uh, Brian Kurtz, uh, thanks for sharing that Harry Potter, no thank you, evil hack on the Slack channel. Very cool. Good work on that. Mm -hmm. Duran Barnett, thanks. Joe, you are amazing. That is fantastic. Wow. Check this out. Check this out. Oh, look, there we go. Stained glass of Sintra. I tried to get that was sold out everywhere here. Oh, wow. That is super awesome. Steve D, thank you. Jeff Seuss, thanks. William Fisher, thank you. And welcome to our latest patron, our latest patron, Diane Tuzano. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> well, that seemed to be the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. 
Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. And if you like the content we're providing and would like to help support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop live to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. We'd like to invite you to hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for an off-the-books after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.